Lord, um, we just ask that you to come speak to us. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to come to a greater degree and quicken our hearts, attune our hearts to you, make us sensitive to you, Father, and Lord, just um, whatever we need to hear, Father, just speak that to us. You are good, Lord. So prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word tonight. And Lord, just guide me. Give me direction. Thank you, Father. Amen. So, can you turn me down a tinge? It's almost back to me a little bit. That drives me crazy. Okay, so uh, we are going to get back on track with our James study here, The Walk. And we did a Q&A last week, which I really enjoyed. I think they're fun. Um, well, we'll do that again for sure. Um, but the week before, we talked about what? Sarah knows. What did we talk about? Oh, get your notebook out. <laughs> We talked about how to gain love for others and you know what it means to not walk by the least of these as scripture calls them how we all have you know one of those people groups usually we, we categorize people we put people in groups and there's nothing wrong with that necessarily as long as we understand that we do that and let people not have to fit in boxes that we put around them. I mean, it's natural for us, or, you know, our brain likes to do things automatically, you know, so that's a natural thing. We just have to fight against that. And we have to fight against the, the selfishness that this culture just pervades in our culture. Selfishness, selfishness. Everything is me-focused, me-oriented. I didn't realize how selfish I was until I started drawing closer to the Lord and you draw closer to him and he's just like I don't know how to even explain it you just realize that you're selfish because he's not and you get around him and you're like wait man I'm selfish and he's not saying like man you're selfish you need to stop that it's just you get close to him and you start realizing you know your stuff comes out you know, let that be an encouragement. As we grow closer to the Lord, um, He's a light, and it shines on things that you don't want shined on. And so sometimes we get discouraged because we feel like we're, we're getting worse, or something like that. Now, there is a thing called, you know, getting worse. You know, choosing to walk in a wrong direction. That's not what I'm talking about. As we are, uh, our intention going after the Lord as we do that, sometimes our stuff, it's like it comes to the surface because the light is in Him is so strong that it pulls our stuff. So the goal for that really is to um, learn to see the difference between conviction and condemnation. Because, you know, Scripture says, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Right? Right? That's right after John 3.16. That's John 3.17, I, I believe. So he does not condemn us. He convicts us. And the difference, many of you have heard this before, but it just we can't go over this enough because we have ingrained in ourselves, many of us, uh, what we think is conviction and it's condemnation. So when you're dealing with your stuff, um, when, anytime you're, you're dealing with your stuff and you're thinking about your stuff, what you, what you focus on, you make room for. Right? Yes. So when we're focused on our sin, it's like we stay in our sin. And we stay there because we can't stop thinking about our sin and how bad we are. 
And conviction is so different because we get close to the Lord and it's like this stuff comes to the surface. And instead of pointing out our sin and him saying like, look what you're doing, that's not good. You need to stop doing that. It's all about that thing, right? That's the focus, that's condemnation. Instead of that, he says, hey, look at that. And then you look and you're like, oh, that's nice. He's like, yeah, that's better. Try that instead. Mm -hmm. And so he's constantly pointing us forward and we're constantly looking at the here and now or in our past. And so we need to get free from that because that hinders us from walking in who we are. So it's this identity theme. So funny, we've been talking really about identity a lot. Kind of it's been weaving through some of the messages, even that the messages we're doing haven't really been focused on identity, but that's been kind of a thread woven through. And guess what? Michael's coming to speak on identity. And I didn't tell him to speak on identity. I said, what do you want to speak on? He said, you know, the Lord keeps giving me this theme of identity. And I said, me too. That'll work. So I don't know what he's going to share about identity, but it'll be fun. So um, why don't you take out your Bibles and turn to James, since that's where we're headed. I have some other scriptures that we'll go through because the best way to interpret scripture is with other scripture. Because you get a whole picture, a big picture. Because, you know, really, you can, read, you can read the Word and you can come up with a, just about any conclusion you want to, if you want to. You can take scriptures way out of context, twist them, contort them, pervert them, make them say just about anything. But when you look at the whole terrain of scripture and you interpret scripture with scripture, you get the big picture. So we see that a lot of times, you know, it's called, I think in script, uh, in theology it's called antimony, which is seemingly two opposing views in Scripture. Like, well, the Bible says this, but it says this. Those are opposites. How could it be? It's either one or the other. Well, they're usually both and. Um, and I believe a lot of that is because uh, a lot of it's situational. So in this situation, yes, this is true. In this situation, this is true. Now, there are truths that don't change. Jesus is the way. That doesn't change. But there's no antimony in Scripture about Jesus. But in the situations where they seem to oppose each other, there's either something we're not seeing or it's a situational type of thing. So, um, as we look in Scripture, it's always good. I just, I'm letting you know that that's why a lot of times I use a lot of Scripture. I don't just go through, I don't just exegete uh, one chapter. I usually use Scriptures to back up what, what I'm pointing out. So, so go to th chapter 3. Let's just go ahead and, and I'm just going to read through the entire chapter. It's not a very long chapter. Just kind of let, let it soak over you. You can read along. You can close your eyes and listen, whatever you want to do. We're just going to read it through. And then we'll start pointing out some things. So, <clears throat> James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes of Israel. Or excuse me, to the 12, 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. I love their little greetings, they're kind of funny. But it gives us a context that, oh, this is actually a letter. These are letters that, that Paul wrote. I think he wrote 14, the, they're called the Pauline epistles. So Paul's, there's 14 different books in the New Testament which are Paul writing letters to the church of like Goshen. But in this case, well, not in this case, but in, in many cases, it's like the Church of Corinth, the Corinthians, the Church of Ephesus, the Ephesians, you know, those types of things. So these, just think of that as we read. Like, he is writing to a, a need in a church. Um, and while this um, is not Paul, it's the same type of thing. These are, these are letters going out to people. Okay, so to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brother. Oh, excuse me. I'm in the wrong chapter. Well, no wonder. It didn't match mine. Yeah. So, so you guys are like, okay, he's he's adding to scripture right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, we just thought you were going to read one, two, and three. Oh no, no, we're not reading all three. I mean, we could, but we'd be here for a while. 
you guys might revolt. Okay, so chapter 3. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are great and are driven by strong winds, still are directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter, jealous, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which from, comes from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed, whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay. So, that last 13 through 18, we're, we're not going to focus on that tonight. We're going to focus on the top part. So, as you may imagine... We're going to be talking about the power of the tongue. And more specifically, the power of spoken word. What does that mean? What does that look like? Why is it powerful? What should we do about it? Um, so just so you know, tonight we don't have a, a meditation and a challenge point. We don't have an outline to go through. Um, we're just going to talk about this because I, I don't want you... Um, I just really felt tonight that it was important not to focus on like what's the answer or where are we headed or anything like that, but just to let you listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you as we're teaching and um, just let Him bring conviction, not condemnation, conviction about your words and how you use them or how you don't use them and. Um, and what the Lord wants to speak about that, okay? So, um, so right away, it says, let, my, let not many of you become teachers because they incur a stricter, stricter judgment. Why would a teacher, why a teacher that gets judged? The context here is the tongue because that's exactly what comes right after. So how does teachers fit into that? Well, I think it's because a teacher doesn't just like read and know a lot of information, right? That's not a teacher. A teacher is one who speaks and proclaims truths, speaks things into being. So there's something about being a teacher that when not only are you speaking, but people are listening to you speaking, and so Therefore, you incur a stricter judgment, meaning your words need to be weighed carefully. So, many times I think to myself, like, what am I doing teaching? 
<laughs> hey, I don't want to be judged harsher, right? There's obviously grace for that. But the point is, check yourself, you know? And so that's why teaching is held to a higher standard. It's not because you're a teacher necessarily, like it's some status thing. It's that you are speaking and people are listening. So it's about that spoken word thing, okay? So then it goes on to say we stumble in many ways. Um, uh, you know, the, the bit in the horse's mouth. So how many of us are feel like we're maybe controlled? Sometimes by our mouth. Our mouth kind of runs. We run our mouths, right? Maybe our mouths run us. I don't know. There, you know, there have definitely been times in my life when literally I would walk away from a situation. I'm like shaking my head at myself. I'm like, what are you doing? Like my my... Stuff just like would come out, and I'd walk away, and I'm like, that was so ridiculous, right? <laughs> and my mouth was not bridled like a horse, right? So we need to put a bit in our mouth, so to speak, and be able to have self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's kind of odd, isn't it? Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. So the abil ability to bridle our tongue is the same way someone with a bit and reins directs a horse, we need to be able to direct our, our mouth, not the other way around. Because I've been in both situations where like, my mouth is running where it wants to, like a wild stallion. And I would literally just walk out of situations like, I can't believe I just said that. So, um, same thing with a boat, small rudder. So let's turn to Matthew. We're going to pull out this issue of defilement because this is very interesting. So, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. What chapter is that? That is um, in James. I haven't gotten to Matthew yet. Um, but you can turn to Matthew. F Let's do 15 first. Um, actually, I'm going to read through a few scriptures. And you may or may not want to flip. I, I'm going to go, just for sake of time, I'll go through them. So you can just write them down if you want to. Um, so we don't have to flip and flip and flip like crazy. So the tongue is a fire, which defiles the entire body. Okay, I think the body that is talking about there is twofold. It's us, our, our body, but it is also the body. So, turn to Matthew 15, verse 11. And Jesus says, It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. Mark 7, verse 15, says the same thing. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. So we're going to go to Luke 6, verse 43 through 45. This is going to expound on that just a little bit. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. Sound familiar? The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. So it's not 
that the word that the words are what is defiling you. It's it's and the point is it's not you know there the context is food sacrificed to idols. Okay, they didn't want to be defiled because the Jewish culture you know the laws and all that it would never touch food that was um, sacrificed to idols. And Jesus is basically saying like that doesn't have any power over you. You can eat whatever you want to eat. What defiles you is that which comes out of your mouth, because what comes out of your mouth, as it says, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Or elsewhere in scripture, it says, out of the mouth, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. Of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sorry, I switched that one around. Okay? So, how many of you have found in, your, in a situation in your life where um, you're speaking, and after, it's kind of like the situation I was talking about, you walk away from a situation and you're like shaking your head. Similarly, have you found yourself in a situation where you speak something and you're like, I didn't know that was in there. So, it's out of the abundance of your heart. So, what I, I found this to be true in my life, I can literally, even at the end of a day or, or whenever, in the middle of a day, look at, I can take like an inventory of the things that I'm speaking. And I'm like, okay, there's negativity in there or whatever. And I can find out what's in my heart because we, we've talked several times already about the scripture that says, um, the heart is sick and deceitful above all things. Who can know it, right? But out of our mouth, we can figure out what's in our heart a lot of times. Because it's, it's when it comes out, we, we recognize that we're defiled. There's defilement in our heart. So it's not necessarily the words, but it's what's in our heart that's producing the words. So you can trace that back, trace those words back and find out what's in your heart many times. These, you know, the quick comments that you make and, you know, that type of thing. So, um, and my wife is good, a good uh, barometer for me because she'll point out like, man, negative today. And I'm like, yeah, must be something going on. And so a lot of times we don't know what's actually deep down in there. We have to take that to the Lord in, in, in prayer and figure out what's going on. But without that spoken word many times, we wouldn't even know what's going on because we, we deceive ourselves. The heart is deceitful. We don't even know that stuff's in there a lot of times. So, um, so yeah, let's be intentional. You know, as we're talking with people, you walk away from a conversation or even in the middle of a conversation, you realize what's coming out of your mouth. Okay, Lord, what's going on? What's, what is in there? And so, you know, when there's a lot of difficulty or stress, you know, probably there's a lot of little negative comments coming out. At least there is for me. Um, and so, trace that back. It's a, it's a good practice. So let's go uh, to Matthew 12 then. This is just going to reiterate what we are just talking about. It's expanding yet even a little more. It's the same um, basic principle that we just read in Luke. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. So does anyone remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree and it just withered? Interesting. It's almost like that scripture in, excuse me, in Revelation where it talks about I wish you were either hot or cold. Otherwise, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He doesn't like lukewarm. And what is most of the Christian church in America today? I think it's lukewarm. Hmm. So just think about that one. We'll go on. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So again, we're just reiterating that. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man out of his evil treasure what is evil. 
But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Do you want to feel the weight on that? Yeah. I have been told, I didn't live back in ancient Jewish culture, but I have been told that um, it was not uncommon for the ancient Jewish cultural context that they believed when you speak a word, it's, it's like, how do, you even, how do you even say this? Like, it's spoken and it never stops speaking. It goes on forever. That's weird to think about, isn't it? You know, I'm not a scientist, but, you know, sound vibrations and all that, I wouldn't be surprised if you could prove that to be the case, scientifically. I don't know, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked. So, if that's true, um, what does that mean for us? I mean, we just, that was a pretty in-your-face scripture, right? But how does that change your thinking about what you say? Because we, you know, I call it verbal diarrhea. Many of us, we just like, this stuff just comes out. Like, we don't think it through, we don't discern it, we don't weigh it, we don't re uh, exercise restraint or self-control or whatever. And not even with the bad things, only, even with the good things. What would it look like to be intentional about everything that we speak, knowing that it never stops speaking, either to the person we spoke it to or to whatever? And what about the effect that we're having on people when we speak? We're going to get to that here in just a second. So just think about that. So let's continue on in verse 7 of James 3. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. Interesting. So, there's something about authority here. In the garden, when God created all the animals, then he told, who named them? Adam named them. So there's, there's something about authority here that what you name, you have authority over. Okay? But it's talking about the, the role humans have. Okay? And again, we're still in James. This is the context of, we're talking about the tongue. So every creature is, has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless, evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. So this is just one more reminder that as we speak, especially as it pertains to people, when we're speaking to people, they were created in the image of God. What would it look like for us to see people in that light? Not see people as like, they need Jesus. But what if we think of them in, in the sense of, they're of Jesus. Big difference, right? So again, this this just goes right with the words that we speak. You know, seeing the reality of who people are and how we speak as a result of that. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send out of the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh water. So, if that which is within us is the issue here, right? Because we speak out of what's inside. What's inside us is important, right? And so, what does it look like to have, to live righteously and speak righteously? 
I think we have to go all the way back to thinking. We've talked about this before, you know, when we talked about strongholds and that type of thing, you know, the be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to go all the way back to thinking because if we just try and change our words, or we just try and change our actions, the things that we're doing, we're missing because it comes all the way from inside here, right? And it really inside here. Inside the heart, I think, is all kind of just one. Um, because what we, what we find is that we think a certain way long enough, eventually you're going to act on it, right? It, what you do comes out of your thinking. And so that may be words, but it also may be actions. It kind of is both. It's both. So then we, we act a certain way long enough, then it becomes a habit. We just do it. We don't even think about it. That's what we do. And then our habits form our character, who we are, which ultimately determines our destiny. So we have to go all the way back to focusing on our thinking. So what does it look like to, to think righteously, not to manage sin? Remember, not... Focusing on, like, I need to quit doing this thing. Quit doing this thing. You need to stop doing this. Whatever, right? What does it look like to start thinking differently and then acting differently because of that? So again, identity is wrapped up in this again. Do you see that? Because if we, if we get back to thinking correctly, not only um, things that are true, but true about ourself, our identity, who we are, things that are true about God, all of a sudden, things start looking different. We start looking differently. So it's that seeing ourselves in the mirror and not walking away and forgetting who we are, but seeing ourselves in the mirror and being who that person we see in the mirror is. That person who Scripture says we are. And focusing on those thoughts, those um, righteous ways of thinking and focusing on the Lord because again you know when we draw close to him we change a lot we change you can't encounter God and look the same afterwards you can't encounter God and stay the way you are I mean you you can try to you, you have to be very deliberate to do that right because an encounter with God changes you so, as we think about the things we, we say and do, um, keep the perspective in mind about the, the way we think, the things that we're thinking. So, let's, let's talk for a second about um, the power of words, okay? So, we've already established that, you know, the, the tongue is hard to tame, but we need to exercise self-control in the things we do, which comes from right thinking, right? Proverbs 18, verse 20 through 21 says, With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. First Peter 3, verse 10 is quoting the Old Testament and saying the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit so it's talking about if you want life and you want to see many days or good days remember life and death are in the power of the tongue so let's step back all the way to Genesis God created this earth and this, everything that we know of and, and see. 
Um, he could have went like that, right? And it could have just, he could have just like thought it and it would have just been. But he spoke everything into being. Interesting. Um, and isn't it interesting that all things have vibration to them? Look it up. I won't go through all this stuff. But, you know, vibrations and matter and all that stuff, light. Everything's made of light. I mean, God is light. I mean, it's just bizarre. It's awesome. So here we have God creating the earth, speaking it into being, and then we, say, we see scriptures that talk about um, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and we see, you know, us being admonished to bridle our tongue because of the power that it has, but yet we walk around with this verbal diarrhea coming out all the time. It's kind of a nasty image if you're visual. But we, we spew this stuff on people all the time and on ourselves because it defiles us. We're coming into agreement with that which is in our heart that shouldn't be there when we let it out, right? So I want to show you a couple. Some of you have seen this already or are familiar with it. Um, but I want to show you some pictures. There's a guy named Dr. Masuru Emoto. He's Japanese. I probably completely butchered his name. Okay. So this guy did these studies. If you YouTube this, you'll see many more pictures that are way better than this. But I just picked out a few, and it's really good. But what he did was he basically took these samples. He, he researched how first, how to take water molecules and with a microscope take pictures of them at the molecular level. He does this by, I think, freezing the water and then he has some special microscope that he uses to take pictures of the images that he sees. So what he did, um, again, You'll have to research if you want the whole thing. But essentially, he took water, and uh, one of the things he did was he laid, put labels on them, words. That was it, on the water. Another thing he did was he, they spoke things, words, over water. They also played music over water. There may have been something else, but they did these things, and then they, after they would do that, subject the water to this whatever they did they freeze it take a microscope and view it under a microscope and these are what you see okay so this is the word thank you that they spoke over this water and then filmed it so you see like beautiful structure um, this is love and appreciation similar the left one is, you make me sick, I will kill you. Compared to the word thank you. This is just water. Okay? And these are just words, like, not God speaking, not like a pastor, no one important. It's just someone saying, I hate you, I want to kill you. Or, thank you. And this is the result of a water, water molecule. So how many of you know, okay, this, this is um, the something dam. I can't pronounce that word, but it's in Japan, I believe. So they took water and filmed it just as it was. It's kind of dirty dam water on the left. Then they, <laughs> they offered a prayer over the water, and that's what you see after the prayer. The, the exact same water from the exact same place. Interesting. So, how many of you know what percentage of our body is made up of water? 70 ish. It ranges. Um, 
let me look here. I wrote down. It's up to 65. Some would argue that it's actually higher. It's more in like the 70, 80 range. I don't know. But it's, it's a lot. And then infants are actually um, up to 78%. They're even higher. Which is interesting because a, an infant is in a very formidable year. Very, they're being molded, shaped by everything around them. Interesting. So how many of you have heard growing up, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Maybe it's sticks and stones will break my, my bones, but words will hurt me forever. Right? Will affect me forever. I don't know. So I say this just to bring to mind the reality of things that we don't see. Over time we see the fruit of things, but we don't realize the words that we speak, how much power they have. We don't realize that maybe we should be intentional about the words we speak. Now we're all different, you know, some of us speak all the time, some of us don't speak much. But what would it look like to weigh and be intentional? Weigh our words. Be intentional about, okay, life or death. I can speak life or I can speak death. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. Your tongue has the power for life or death. That's interesting. I mean, that's powerful. So, obviously, you don't, you don't curse someone and then they fall dead instantly, right? I mean, not that it can't happen. Paul did it in Acts. But the same way sin is just increased death, it will just increase and increase and increase and increase slowly, gradually. The, the earth, the world that we live in that is full of sin is decaying, right? We do that same thing when we speak death over people or ourselves. So um, I, I have instructed people on many occasions to write down things that God says about them, who they are, their identity, that type of thing, and literally for a, a period of time um, speak it over themselves. and. I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, given that instruction to people and they're like, oh my God, I do that. That's weird. And it is weird. It's awkward, right? I am who God says I am. Right? I mean, it's weird. But there's power in spoken word. There's power in spoken word. Sometimes we'll talk about... Um, what's called the law of observation, or it's, you, if you want to look it up on Google, you would probably e more easily find it under the observer effect. And I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but um, in addition to our words um, being very powerful and how we affect other people, um, if you want to take it up even another level, science is actually proving that your thoughts can make things change in people. The way that you view yourself and the way that you view others has an effect on them. It's crazy. Crazy. So, that's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff. But we have a choice. Um, you know, with the bad is the good. Life. So let's not focus on the, the death, like stop speaking death over people. But what about how do we speak life into people? How do we over time see people get more and more life, get more and more healing just because we're speaking? And there's something, you know, faith is mixed in here in the sense that once we recognize, oh, um, yeah, when I speak to people, it actually impacts them. It speaks life or it speaks death to them. And if they come into agreement with that, then it really ex expands um, and takes a hold. 
But what if we, we think about that and say, okay, now I'm going to be intentional about speaking life. Um, and then the things that we speak, not only do we hold them a little more sacred, but we also, once we do this, we start being more concerned and have more of a habit of asking, um, how do I say it, speaking to people um, more of what God is saying, not just our opinions. Right? Our opinion, I'm, the Lord, over the past several years and continually, He continues to sh uh, show me and speak to me about my opinions. And I'm finding that my opinions are such a hindrance to me in hearing from the Lord and experiencing the Lord. And one of the things he showed me recently was, you know, basically, you know, you, you want wisdom, but you can't have my wisdom because your opinion is too strong. You have to give up your opinion, what you believe or what you want to think or what you want to feel if you want wisdom. Because wisdom of this world is foolishness to the natural man. If you want his wisdom, now, you can have worldly wisdom, and people think you're great. And, oh man, you have so much wisdom, you know stuff. But if you want real, true wisdom that comes from above, you have to give something up, and that is your opinions and your will. That's a hard thing. That's a really hard thing. Because, you know, with, like we were talking about at the beginning, this where a selfishness self-driven culture um, where do you think opinionated comes from <laughs> self-driven culture what you think and what you want is more important than anything that's not true and so we have to fight against you know in many ways you know in our culture in America we've seen unprecedented uh, blessing I mean you look at everywhere else in the country pretty much and then you, you come here to America and you see like the things we have, the things we can do, and you're like, there is no place on earth like this. We have been absolutely blown away by God's um, blessings. But in many ways, it has been, and a lot of it has to do with the way we have received it, um, has been a hindrance to our spiritual growth because we have so many things distracting us. We have a culture that is so ingrained in us, but the problem is that what's ingrained in us from this culture is not spiritual minded. It's not others focused, it's not God focused, it's me focused, it's self focused. So we are really at a disadvantage when we, we look around the world, when you travel the world, you see people that don't have near the physical blessings that we have in this country, but what they have that we don't have in many cases is something different. It's like they understand that they need God. Like, well, we don't just like go to the store and get a get some aspirin because we have a headache or go to the doctor and have surgery and get something fixed. It's like there is no doctor, there is no medicine. If God doesn't heal, we die. And really, that's reality. We live in a fantasy world where we think we're in control, we think we can get these quick fixes, we think it's all about us. It's not true. Um, you know, the Lord really showed me about seven years ago that when what I thought I was in control, it was actually a, an illusion. It, I was only in control to the degree in which he allowed me to be in control because I'm absolutely not in control of absolutely anything. That's a helpless place to be. And that's the best place to be. When we are weak, he is strong. It's true. So becoming weak, becoming humble, becoming meek and lowly, just like Jesus being led to the slaughter not considering equality with God something to be grasped, but giving his life. We can do the same thing for other people. We can set aside our opinions, our desires, our wants, our needs, our whatever, 
and say, okay, this is just a simple, basic conversation, but you are made of water, you are made of life, and I have the power in me to speak life and speak death into you. And I get to choose whether I do one or the other. So now a simple chat at the coffee shop where you run into someone that you weren't planning on seeing, now it's, it's all of a sudden a divine encounter. But all of that comes through the faith of understanding of who we are, who God is, and the reality all around us that we tend not to see. Because of our culture, we have to get out of our culture, the natural, the things we see, the, the physical world, and realize that the physical world is passing away as we speak. It is dying and decaying as we take every breath. And so the spiritual world around us is actually more real than what we see. And so it, we need to step by step get closer and closer and closer to the reality that we understand that reality here isn't reality. That we've actually, when we get saved, we are already in eternity because we're connected with the one thing that will be constant forever, which is Christ. So, how many of you want divine encounters? I do. Mm -hmm. You have them every day. Life and death comes out of your mouth. And for me, that's very convicting. Because I forget, you know. We forget. So we just need reminded. It's not like we're bad. We just need reminded. And we need to encourage each other. We're not in this thing alone for a reason. We're in this together for a reason. So let's let's just stand, and uh, we're going to pray. <clears throat> so, Father, we just ask that you would come, make your home in us to a greater degree. And Lord, I ask for every person here that you would rewire our thinking, challenge us to see you as you see us, see others as you see them, and walk as you've created us to walk, that you would bind our tongues from evil and loose them for good, the good that only comes from you. Lord, your word says that what we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So with that truth, we come into agreement that we will walk increasingly more with tongues that are loosed for your kingdom. That you would give us eyes to see what you are doing in people. And that we would partner with that and speak life. Speak that which is not as though it was. Speak heaven on earth as it is in heaven. By your grace and your mercy, we will do this, Lord. And we thank you, we love you, we worship you, we praise you, we give everything to you, Lord. And in everything, we acknowledge that you are good. <clears throat>